In today's video, we're answering your questions on brachytherapy. We're covering things like what it'll be like after having brachytherapy and what sexual intimacy looks like, things like what to do if you do have um, seminal vesicle invasion or invasion in the lymph nodes, and so much more. We have a previous presentation from Dr. Ankit Agarwal and Dr. Steve Kurtzman. They did a presentation for us back in September of 2023. It's very thorough, and it goes through how brachytherapy is done both in low dose and high dose seed rates. I would encourage you to watch it, and we'll go ahead and link that in the description of this video and in the comment section. But today we're talking to Dr. Mark Schultz, who's a 30-year medical oncologist who's focused solely in prostate cancer, and he's going to answer your questions. So one of the questions that we get in brachytherapy, you know, we have low dose rate seeds, we have high dose rate seeds, and people are wondering which one is better? Well, I think they're close to each other, and both are good. Uh, so we've always emphasized the quality of the implanter is certainly a far greater issue than the selection of the implant. I tend to acknowledge that low-dose rate seeds, the, the permanent seeds, tend to be preferred for the intermediate risk, and the high-dose rate or the temporary seeds tend to be preferred for the high-risk patients. I think it's more of a convention than it is uh, an actual preference for men that have locally advanced disease where the tumors invading up into the seminal vesicles, for example, that the high dose rate doctors have more flexibility for sticking their catheters in the seminal vesicle and radiating outside and around the prostate, though I think some of the low dose rate implanters would dispute that. So I, I'm outlining some of the different arguments that occur, but I think that a highly qualified doctor uh, with low dose rate seeds can accomplish most, if not everything, that a highly qualified doctor with high dose rate seeds can accomplish. Is there easier access to one than another? Because I know it's so dependent on the doctor and really finding a center of excellence in these situations. So is there more people doing high dose versus low dose? Low dose rate has been far more popular uh, throughout uh, the history, and this is over a 30 year history now. I think the entry level financially is much easier. High dose rate, you have seeds that are um, burning 24 hours a day and they have to be replaced. If a center doesn't have a large volume to utilize these seeds, then they're being wasted. Uh, low dose rate seeds are ordered for each patient individually and uh, they don't need the computerized equipment for the delivery process that uh, high dose rate seeds need. I think uh, those are one of the reasons that low dose rate seeds are more popular. I, I think that the process of getting the seed implants is simpler for people with low dose rate seeds, which is a much shorter uh, outpatient procedure. High dose rate seeds, you're gonna be in the hospital at least for a day and possibly have to come back for a second day a week later. So it's not surprising, I think, that the low-dose rate seeds historically have been more popular. If you want your questions answered in person by world-renowned experts and be able to get multiple opinions all at once, our conference is a great place to do that. You can learn more at pcri.org and sign up there. Now, if you would like to donate to PCRI, you could also do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. And please click that subscribe button because when you do this, it tells the YouTube algorithm that this video is helpful for you and it'll push our videos out to other people who need help. And so clicking that subscribe button is a great way to support us. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Scholz. So when it comes to side effects, are there more side effects with high dose? When we think about high dose versus low dose, you hear the word high, so you'd think there's more radiation, it's maybe a larger field, and would there be more side effects and more opportunity for it to hit healthy tissue? The answer to that is an unequivocal no. I think that the side effects are dependent on the skill and the quality of the implanter, to a small degree perhaps upon the biological makeup of the patient. And then the size of the prostate and the size of the tumor, uh, so larger areas that need to be radiated are gonna put people at a little higher risk of side effects. So one of the questions that we got is, are these seeds metal? And if so, is it okay to have you know MRIs and CT scans after? Will it affect any scanning and imaging that is done? One of the attractive things about high dose rate seeds is they don't leave any radiation or seeds in your body after the treatment is completed. Everything's been removed. Patients who have Permanent seeds, uh, which are implanted in the prostate, I have not heard of them becoming in any way a difficulty for MRIs. We do MRIs all the time after permanent seeds, and it's never been an issue. What type of seeds do they use, and are there better seeds you know, than others? Do you need to make sure you have a certain type of manufacturer to get the best outcome? So for permanent seeds, they have iodine, palladium, and cesium seeds, and the difference between these seeds is how long they burn after 
they're implanted. Iodine burned the longest, and those were the original seeds that were used at the uh, inception of seed implant therapy close to 30 years ago. Palladium seeds came along next, and cesium seeds, which burned the fastest, uh, were the ones uh, that came out on the market more recently. I don't see a big difference between these different products. It's the familiarity of the doctor with the seed implant and uh, how to utilize these different uh, time periods, a high, shorter, more intense period with cesium, longer, lower dose exposure with the iodine seeds and the palladium in between. And uh, doctors who are doing seed implants typically use just one of these isotopes to be familiar and expert in using that particular isotope. I don't uh, select doctors on the basis of what isotope they use. I select doctors on the basis of their outcomes. So this next person was wondering, is brachytherapy really the best way to preserve you know, function when it comes to urinary function? Because they're really concerned about that specifically. They want to protect the urethra. And they're going, is low dose better? Is high dose better? Is this really the best radiation for me because of that wanting to protect that area? Well, I think their concern is uh, very appropriate in that aside from the side effects of erectile dysfunction, which are a real problem with any kind of radiation, the next level of concern is uh, damage to the urethra and long-term urinary side effects. The third issue that used to be a bigger issue was uh, damage to the rectal wall, which is right next to the prostate, leading to long-term proctitis or inflammation of the rectal wall. That's been mostly circumvented with these uh, gel implants. Urethral issues, especially the lingering ones, which are a major concern with any type of radiation, are dependent on the skill of the implanter and also the biology of the patient. Some patients, a small percentage apparently, are more predisposed to poor recovery of, uh, from the radiation exposure and, and lingering long-term discomfort, urinary frequency, pretty much the, the, the one issue, the long-term issue, apart from erectile dysfunction, that we are concerned about. But I can't point to uh, one type of radiation that is less likely to create problems. It's more an issue of the skill of the doctor in modulating the amount of exposure that the urethra will experience uh, in that unique individual. This is a skill, and uh, the doctors who are doing these implants are highly aware of the urethra, where it's located, and uh, what kind of exposure will be tolerable. So you mentioned the genetic makeup of a patient and whether or not they would experience more side effects or less side effects. We see that Prostox is on the market for radiation side effects. Is that also covered within brachytherapy? Unfortunately not. So the Miradex company, which has come up with these genetic assays to determine who's going to do better with short-term beam radiation or long-term beam radiation, haven't been compiled yet for brachytherapy. So this was a discussion that I saw in the comment section. There was a patient who posted that he wasn't expecting to lose his ability to orgasm with having brachytherapy. And he's wondering, you know, he's 10 days out of the procedure. He's wondering if this is going to be a permanent thing. And then what to do if it is? Well, that problem is uh, usually associated with people that are on hormonal testosterone deprivation therapy and very common for men to not be able to get excited enough to have orgasms. Uh, that problem usually reverses when the testosterone returns after the hormone treatment is stopped. Onset of a similar problem in, in someone who's not on hormone therapy, I haven't heard of that. When they're talking about inability to orgasm, they may be talking about dry orgasms because the prostate makes the fluid and uh, as treatment starts to uh, gain traction against the cancer and against the prostate, men will develop uh, dry orgasms. But the sensation of orgasms doesn't go away, it's just that there's no fluid. So I'm not sure specifically if they're talking about also being on hormone treatment or if they're talking about dry orgasms, but the inability to have orgasms after a seed implant is not a problem that I've run into. So we have a Gleasonate patient who his doctor is suggesting because he does have some pelvic um, lymph node invasion, you know, he's saying, well, we, let's do the brachytherapy and do IMRT at the same time. And the patient's wondering if he does the IMRT on top of the brachy, what percentage, you know, survival rates does this increase? You know, is it going to be more successful or is it really targeting the lymph nodes? Treating lymph nodes with brachytherapy is certainly not an option. And of course, leaving the lymph nodes untreated is, in my mind is not an option. The IMRT component seems to be essential for this ind individual that he would get uh, his best chance for remission and cure uh, by treating all the known disease. So you can't treat lymph nodes with brachytherapy? Technically you can, uh, but 
The idea with uh, any kind of lymph node disease is that what is being detected on the scans may only be the tip of the iceberg. There may be other microscopic areas. And so the policy is typically to treat that whole field of lymph nodes, not just that lymph node. You're not going to be able to treat a field of lymph nodes with brachytherapy, though you could treat an individual lymph node with high dose rate brachytherapy. That would be unorthodox. I've seen it done, but it's way down the list in terms of uh, what's likely to be done for lymph node disease. What is the most common side effect that you see as a medical oncologist seeing patients after brachytherapy? Number one concern is erectile dysfunction. Uh, so if you say take a 60-year-old healthy male who's not taking any Viagra, the onset of severe erectile dysfunction uh, that doesn't respond to Viagra is about one in three men uh, in the ensuing two years. So the second most concerning problem is long-term urinary irritation, discomfort, frequency that lingers, and that occurs maybe in three or four percent of men, still ongoing more than a year after the implant. Do you see that brachytherapy is covered with most insurances? Yes. It's not in any way less likely to be covered than other forms of treatment like surgery or radiation. Is there a point where there's too much prostate cancer in the prostate and brachytherapy is just not an option and you just need to use the other measures that we talked about in previous questions like IMRT or beam radiation or hormone therapy? Well, hormone therapy I won't go into, but adding beam radiation therapy to Permanent seeds has been a pretty much standard policy, and it's not at all uncommon to add beam radiation to high dose rate uh, brachytherapy. The policies, I think, were of, of doing that, of adding beam radiation, were mostly due to the desire of beam radiation doctors not to lose their hand in the whole process, and, and uh, I think there are some actually profit motives that drive that. But the uh, idea that you can put a little wider margin around the prostate with beam radiation uh, is theoretically true. The fact that there's a lot of studies uh, looking at permanent seed radiation with beam radiation, far more studies than have looked at just seed radiation as a standalone. All these things because doctors like to do what's been done and be safe and mainstream with their actions lead people to often think of with high-risk patients of adding beam radiation over the top of the seed radiation. Whether that's truly necessary in the hands of a truly superb seed implanter, I'm not convinced, but I would say that the policies that are ongoing in uh, most typical throughout the United States are to add beam radiation in high-risk patients on top of the seed implant. As I mentioned in my intro, a great presentation if you want to learn more about brachytherapy is by Dr. Ankeet Agarwal and Dr. Steve Kurtzman. They are experts in this field, they've done thousands of these procedures, and they go through the ins and outs of low-dose and high-dose brachytherapy. So if you want more information or you're looking at brachytherapy as an option, that's a great presentation, and we'll link it in not only the description but in the comment section because I want to make sure it's very easily accessible to you. Now, thank you so much for leaving your comments and your questions. This is the way that we develop a lot of our content. So if you have more questions or comments or things that you just want clarity on and you would like Dr. Scholz to answer, you can go ahead and leave them in the comment section below this video or on any of our other videos. We really appreciate it. Now, in any situation, whether it's brachytherapy or any other forms of radiation, hormone therapy, quality of life is so important. So if you're going to these doctor's appointments and you're talking about treatments like brachytherapy, bring up your concerns ahead of time. Ask them and say, I want to preserve my quality of life. I want to preserve my sexuality. I want to preserve my urinary function. What is the best way to do that? How can I do that? And if I can't, is there anything that I can do to mitigate it? Is there anything I can do before or after and just get real clarity on what to expect and get vocal about what your concerns are. Maybe bring someone with you to these appointments. It's important that you advocate for yourself, you get your questions answered and that you really find out the ins and outs of what you're looking at after the operation is done. Sometimes at home care or just even simple little things that you can do at home just to take care of yourself after a procedure can just make a world of difference. So even asking the nursing teams and the maybe the uh, office staff, just ask the questions and see what their answers are. You'll never know the information that you pick up. And also another thing that's really helpful is reading on forums like Health Unlocked or reading doctor's reviews and just seeing what patients are saying about the specific, either the doctor that you're, you know, looking to have the procedure done by or the office or even just the procedure itself. It's just a great way to attain information over time and build up your knowledge so that you can walk in with confidence knowing what is going to happen and knowing the side effects, what to expect. All of this just 
this helps your mental health, emotional health, and your healing process after the procedure. Now, if you would like help with your specific case, you can contact our helpline at pcri.org forward slash helpline. These are prostate cancer patients who have a wealth of information. It's just a great way to build up your education and empower yourself with information over time. And if you'd like more information in general, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel because we come out with new prostate cancer videos every week. Please reach out to us if you need help. And most of all, remember, you're not alone.